I'm gonna grade. Get your clickers ready. Do you need to do anything? No, not yet. Did you see the seating chart that I sent? I sent you a PDF of it. I, I saw that you sent it. I haven't opened it yet. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I will. I will. What a slacker. <laughs> yeah, it looks really nice. It does? Okay. I'm oh, sorry. yeah. No, that's all right. I, just, I was just showing it off, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You put so much work in it. I'll, I'll make sure to ooh and on next time I see you. <laughs> well, that's not necessary. All right. Now, students. My wonderful students, I'm so happy to see you, although I am not happy about the weather. Florida, the Sunshine State, it does not look like sunshine out there at the present time. I don't know what to do about it. Uh, we're going to talk about planets and isotopes today. Uh, hopefully dismiss a little bit early if you are favor of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but first, let's do a little bit of discussion of exam 10. Now, we don't have the exam scored yet. We're still waiting on that. But hopefully by tomorrow, uh, they'll have that stuff squared away. And over the weekend, it's... You know, over the weekend, I'll try to post results. And then Tuesday, I'll bring the printouts in. And we'll just take, uh, Courtney and I will take 10 minutes at the beginning of lecture on Tuesday to hand them back to you. Uh, and you'll be able to see on those printouts which question you got incorrect. I'll also publish separately as a PDF inside web courses a little blurb sheet which tells you for each test form uh, and for each question uh, a little bit of information of not the verbatim question itself, but just a little description of it, you know, like elliptical eccentricity or aphelion concepts or something like that. And so that way with the exam printout and the blurb sheet, you'll be able to uh, identify a basic pattern if there is any in your errors and then use that to study for the final because the final is cumulative. And you could see questions similar to exam X on the final. Therefore, it behooves you to be prepared. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, there, right now there's a new uh, row in your grades page. It says exam X Scantron. Now, there's no numbers in there yet, but when I um, upload those data for you, that's where it, it'll be. And that'll be the Scantron part, something out of 46. Don't forget, we also have the clicking, and I haven't graded the clicking data yet. Although I did talk to somebody after class, I don't know if it was this one or the morning section, that nailed it. it was very nervous, and... When I, I think it was the morning class, uh, calculating the distance to that star, the second clicker question. Uh, and I think for this class, the number of parsecs was five. Does that? Yeah, so the, paral the parallax was 0 0.2. Raise your hand if you remember getting a five on that. Oh. That's so many. That means I'm going to have to make exam three hard. No, I'm just kidding. I, I love seeing a lot of hands on that. And so if you get it, you got it. Uh, but, you know, exam three, you know, there will be some brain burners. I'll try to burn your brains. But if your brains are fireproof, they're fireproof. What can I do? All right. Now, um, if, uh, go ahead and ask a question if you still have uh, something that's eaten you or concerning you about the exam. Question. Well, I don't know because I write the brain burners, but what I consider a brain burner, somebody else might consider cinchy. So I, as I recall thinking, um, 
I sometimes type in the word brain burner in the problem itself. Now, the first clicker question was not a brain burner, except the fact that you had to think. There was several different ways to answer that, and so that automatically makes it not a brain burner, unless you screw up or something. But uh, now the second one was that you had the formula for it, and a lot of people, I didn't figure that one would be a brain burner for everybody. I actually was thinking that a couple, three of the multiple choice questions uh, were brain burners, and just one point each, of course, but uh, let's see. I asked you about what's the semi-minor axis of one of the ellipses from that table? And I thought, this one will make him think. And a couple others, I can't remember exactly what. I was, you know, when I was typing it up, I thought, okay, this will be a good brain burner. So, but there'll be brain burners on the next exam. And, you know, if we ever have any homework to, to do like a quiz or something in web courses, I might throw one or two in there as well. But uh, by the way, this weekend you'll have some reading homework uh, in chapter seven, I think. And let's talk about chapter seven, planets in the solar system. Uh, this is figure two uh, from that chapter. And I really like this picture because it's, it's written with, uh, uh, we're going to be having clicker questions. So make sure your clicker's ready. That guy won't. Anyways, this diagram, uh, it, it's, uh, it's drawn kind of from a perspective, actually kind of uh, out of the solar system and a little bit north of the solar system. Okay, so you can kind of see the way things are circling around there. And so you're kind of looking down on it and you're off to the side a little bit. Uh, so you're out somewhere in the Kuiper belt, I guess, and above the solar system. And the blue lines here are the planets, the eight planets. The red ones are things like asteroids and, and comets and Kuiper Belt objects. Now this one up here, uh, let me get my cursor. This one up here, Eris, is particularly large. Uh, it's um, it's a, uh, uh, what we call a dwarf planet, Pluto dwarf planet. Um, there's a bunch of other ones in there. Down here towards the middle, you see a small red orbit. Uh, that is Ceres, C-E-R-E-S. And that is an asteroid in the asteroid belt. Matter of fact, it's a pretty big asteroid in the asteroid belt. And we have a spacecraft uh, out there right now or recently uh, studying Ceres. Um, the hope is with NASA and many uh, space scientists that eventually we can go out to the asteroids and mine them for metal and for stuff like ices, uh, CO2 and water ice, because uh, some of the asteroids will have a little bit of that. The comets will have tons of water and CO2 ice and other ices. Uh, so if we ever get, you know, capture a tame comet and extract water, CO2 from that, we could colonize um, you know, other planets and stuff. So that's kind of what they're thinking. So they're studying series. They're studying a lot of stuff. And the other thing that's kind of nice about this, you can see how the blue planets, the blue orbits of the planets, they're all pretty level. They're all pretty much, you know, plus or minus a few degrees. You know, they are tilted up, slanted upwards a little bit, but pretty much they're all about the same orientation. Now, the red ones, like Eris, is really tilted, all right? Pluto is tilted. So are the other ones, all right? And uh, we'll be studying those things in detail uh, as we go through Chapter 7 in the coming week. Uh, here's some more comments, comments about comets, etc. Chapter 7, Other Worlds. Um, and this is a, a diagram, or excuse me, a table from chapter seven. 
And it basically lists the items in the solar system and the percent of the total mass of the solar system in each object. The sun comprises most of the matter. So most of the kilograms in our solar system are hydrogen and helium, and they're in the sun. All right? It's 98 point something percent. I'll blow it up in a minute. Jupiter comprises most of the leftovers. Jupiter is a tenth of a percent. All right, now the rest of it is actually, you know, you know, so Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth, and all the asteroids and stuff is uh, a small fraction of a percent. So most of the material of the planets is actually concentrated in the largest one, Jupiter. And it is more massive than the rest of all the, than all the rest of the planets combined, which is kind of interesting. Now, let's take a look at this table uh, a little bit more closely. And what I want to draw your attention to specifically here, you can go and study it later in the, in the textbook if you like. But what I want to talk about right now, and have your clicker ready, uh, frequency DD. Uh, and uh, we're on, so you should be able to get, don't start it yet. We don't, not, not quite yet. What we're going to concentrate on for the next clicker question is this figure, 99.8%. Uh, of the total mass of the solar system is in the SUN. And then here's the other one that we're going to focus on. 0.10%, uh, a tenth of a percent of the total mass of the solar system is concentrated in Jupiter. All right, so Jupiter is a big one. But compared to the SUN, it's pretty small. And that's what we're going to try to get a hold of. All right, so jot those numbers down. And here is your um, first clicker question. Go ahead. This is multiple choice. Okay, just close that. Okay. Um, go ahead and start voting. Great. Uh, vote for A, B, C, or... I guess you can vote for D if you want, but... I ran... Sometimes, you know... If you see on a test where, that I have something goofy like Chuck Norris uh, or Bob or, you know, Justin Bieber or something goofy, it's because I just couldn't come up with any more tempting alternatives. <laughs> You're supposed to have four at least, and I just, you know, this morning I was typing this question out. I thought, uh, I'll just type in Bob. Anyway, so you got a bunch of ratios there. Uh, good. Go ahead. I'll give you... A, uh, 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 184, sweet, 185, 0. And it looks like most of you answered correctly. Uh, go ahead and write that down, 998 to 1. That's another way to express the relative proportions of, of just the Sun and, and, the, so, and the, uh, uh, the Sun and Jupiter. Right? This is forgetting about everything else. It's roughly um, nearly a thousand to one. All right now I want you to that's what I want you to think about. It's a thousand to one. So the, the number of kilograms in Jupiter, uh, it's going to contain a lot of hydrogen, but there's all kinds of other uh, metals in, hydro in, in Jupiter. Uh, uh, but it's pretty shrimpy compared to the sun. And a lot of people always ask me, Dr. B, is Jupiter big enough to actually be a small star? And the answer to that is N-O. Not really. It's about 10 times too small for that. If you, if you got up to about 1% of the mass of the sun, maybe you could be a star under the right conditions. Right? There are stars that are that small. This one's a little bit... So it's a planet, and it's a big one. Now, um, so go ahead and jot that down. Nearly 1,001. And that's how you would write it down with numbers. Now, here's something I want you to kind of visually look at. I don't know how you can make notes of this, but um, here's a another thousand to one ratio. That white tank 
in the driveway next to that car, uh, that's a thousand liters. It's basically a cubic centimeter, or excuse me, a cubic meter. All right, that's one thousand liters. Now over here to the side, uh, that's a one liter bottle of smart water, and I shrank it down so that it looks at a, about the right size. Okay. All right, so now that's Jupiter compared to the sun, visually compared, all right? And so um, uh, that's another way to think about it. So, uh, so just go ahead and jot down in your, in your notes, 1,000 liter tank of water versus a one liter bottle of smart water or anything else that you buy uh, that's uh, a liter, one liter. That's about 1,000 to one. By the way, uh, a thousand liters of water is a thousand kilograms. Go ahead and jot that down. A thousand kilograms is a metric ton. So that object, uh, that tank, if you were to try to pick it up, you'd be lifting you and Arnold and a bunch of other people. If you could try to lift that, you'd be lifting one metric ton if it's full. Okay. You can't really tell if it's full, but I mean, if it was full, yeah, 1,000 liters, all right? Now, um, we're going to talk more about the masses and all the other features of the planets. We're going to compare it to the sun. We're going to compare them to Earth as well. So that'll be one of the uh, ratios that we try to look at next week and that you'll th be thinking about as you read over the weekend with your homework number five. Homework number five will be ready oh, about lunchtime tomorrow, if not sooner. So uh, be ready for that. Another thing that we want to do um, is dip further into uh, chapter seven. And this is a diagram, uh, figure two, from section 7.3. And if you look carefully down here on the horizontal scale, it says number of half-lives, right? The number of half-lives, that's a term indicating radioactive decay. And so I want to talk a little bit about radioactive decay and isotopes, because those are very important for us in astronomy, uh, in analyzing things like comets, asteroids, moon rocks, stuff like that. So let me uh, start with another clicker question, multiple choice. And this one, uh, hope, before we do this question, you can go ahead and start it. Um, how many protons are in the nucleus of hydrogen? Just one. Are there any neutrons in a regular hydrogen atom? No, there are not. Uh, how many electrons in a regular neutral hydrogen atom? One, okay. So hydrogen is the, is the lightest element, it's the simplest, most of the time. So this question is about water, which contains two hydrogens and one oxygen. Now this little slice of the periodic table will let you figure out the same information, how many protons in an oxygen atom. And for every, at, for every molecule of water, there's one oxygen. All right, so go ahead and answer uh, A, B, C, D, or E. How many protons in a molecule of H2O? Just one molecule. Two H's and an O. And hey, you guys, why not jot the question down in your notes? You know, because I might give you a question on the next test uh, specifically about this question. Because water is pretty important. We see it all over the universe. It's all over our planet. As a matter of fact, it's all over Florida right now. Okay, with this weather we've been having. All right. So, okay, uh, 15 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good. We got your click. 
You came, you came in right at the, at the right time. Got it. Zero. But did you answer correctly? Raise your hand if you voted for 10. Sweet. Yeah, most of you voted uh, 67%. If you didn't, let's look at the specs here. In the periodic table, uh, and you're going to want to be familiar with it, there's two numbers usually in a periodic table. There's the one on top, that's the atomic number, and that tells you how many protons. In this case, eight. How many protons in the nucleus? That's what identifies oxygen as an oxygen atom, how many protons it has. The lower number, which is being pointed out here, tells you the total number of objects in the nucleus. Now, the top number says eight of them are protons, and the bottom number says 16 in all, so that means another eight are neutrons. All right, so, so go ahead and make a note. Uh, oxygen is, uh, most oxygen is eight and eight. It's called oxygen 16, and that's actually an isotope of oxygen. It's the most common one. Look at chlorine, though. Look at this number down here for chlorine, 35.45. Now, does that mean that my nucleus has 0.45 of a neutron or 0.45 of a proton? No, it does not. It means that in nature, there are some 36s and there are some 35s. And those are what we call isotopes. Or, or that number is, is a sign that in nature... There is more than one isotope of chlorine. Now let's take a look at what an isotope means in specific. It tells you, um, here's three isotopes, hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, and hydrogen 3. Um, the uh, notation is the following, that the mass number is in the upstairs. So for this is the simplest hydrogen there is. Um, a single uh, item in the nucleus. The atomic number is the lower number, the subscript in front. Uh, and then the chemical symbol, H for hydrogen. Now we'll be able to write this down and we're going to write it down for several other elements. You know, like uranium. If you've ever read in the news, uh, lately these guys over in Iran, uh, they're trying to refine missile grade uranium and that means they're trying to refine out the uh, uranium-238 isotope and keep the uranium-235 isotope, all right? So let's talk about isotopes. It's basically an atom with extra neutrons in the nucleus or maybe fewer neutrons than normal. So if you think in terms of oxygen, most oxygen in the universe is eight plus eight. So if you have more than eight neutrons in the nucleus, you're still, you're still an oxygen, but you're considered an isotope uh, relative to the common eight plus eight version. Now, let's, let's work it out for hydrogen. Here are the three isotopes we just talked about, and I'm gonna give you a little bit more detail. First one, regular hydrogen. This one we talked about, one proton and one electron orbiting the nucleus. Ding, there's its picture. Go ahead and sketch it out. A proton, red, electrons are blue. And 99.9885% of all hydrogens that we find um, are this kind. But there's a little bit of isotope action. And that's the next one. Deuterium isotope. It's a proton and a neutron bound together in the nucleus. Here's a sketch of it. Okay. The proton and the neutron, neutron is black with a capital letter N, but it still has one proton. So that means it's still, chemically speaking, it's considered hydrogen, all right? Now, all of chemistry, you know, like 99.9999% of chemistry is electrical. So if you just have one positive um, proton in the nucleus, that's electrical. That means you've got hydrogen, even if you have a neutron, because a neutron doesn't add any charge, all right? If you had another proton, that would make it a helium, 
All right. Uh, so that's how that works. Anyways, 0.0115% of all hydrogens that we see uh, are deuteriums. Now, the word deuterium comes from the Greek word uh, deutere or deutero, I guess. Uh, it means two. Okay. And you sumped, we don't use. Uh, that Greek prefix a whole lot in English. Uh, we tend to use um, bi, bi for, you know, for uh, bivalve or, you know, uh, and we use, but we do use tri, T-R-I, to symbolize three. And that's our next one. Now, one slight caveat. If you're near a nuclear reactor, you're going to see a lot more of these babies, the deuteriums, because a nuclear reactor operates under the principle of neutrons flying around and causing more nuclear reactions. They use water and other substances to catch neutrons and moderate the reaction. Just kind of keep it under control. They don't want to detonate a nuclear device in the middle of Charleston, South Carolina, or anywhere else that there's a power plant. So they have to moderate it. And one of the things they do is use water, graphite, other substances to swallow neutrons. And when water swallows a neutron, a lot of times it'll turn a regular hydrogen into a deuterium. And so if you are near uh, a nuclear uh, reactor, you'll sometimes see these babies. Oh, by the way, um, there was a controversy a few weeks ago about the, this joker over in Korea, uh, the little rocket man, they, they call him. And those guys in Korea, they had a nuclear weapon and they tested it underneath a big mountain. And so the U.S. Uh, Air Force sent a bunch of, and you know, the Japanese, they sent planes to uh, fly along the coast of North Korea and try to sample the air. And what they were looking for were isotopes in the air of stuff like deuterium and other nuclear isotopes that would be made inside the uncontrolled nuclear reaction that we call um, a nuclear bomb or a nuclear weapon detonation. Okay, all kinds of isotopes are made. And you know, the rock is vaporized. So you, in the rock, there's going to be a lot of carbon and silicon and oxygen. So these planes, they call them sniff, sniffer planes, and they just, you know, they just scoop up a lot of air, filter it out, and see if they can find radioactive isotopes like deuterium or oxygen or carbon or, you know, any, any, anything they can to indicate the presence of a nuclear test. This is also the origin of the word heavy water. Now, over there in Iran, they're trying to have uh, nuclear weapons. And one of the special kind of reactors they have over there is called a heavy water reactor. Okay. In World War II, there, were some Germ there was uh, a German effort to, to conquer Norway. Uh, and one of the fruits of their conquest was to um, steal a big supply of heavy water at um, uh, hydroelectric, the Norsk uh, hydroelectric uh, plant up in the mountains of Norway, uh, which was, you know, it's a hydroelectric plant, you know, water falling downhill, goes to the turbines, the turbines spin, that causes the generator to spin. You get a lot of electricity for people in Norway. But what, what uh, some of the Norwegians had been doing before the war and during the war, they were... They were goofing around. They were, you know, doing chemistry experiments. And they were trying to isolate deuterium. And if, when, when you drink a glass of water every day, or a can of a soda pop every day, you're drinking some deuterium. It's in there. There's enough atoms of uh, hydrogen in the water in a can of Pepsi that, yeah, bunches of those are going to be deuteriums. I mean, it's just, you know. And most of them are regular H's, just proton and electron. But there's going to be a few 
Those are the per- that's the percentage up there, less than, less than a percent, less, almost a hundredth of a percent. Uh, and so, so but in, in Norway, that's what those scientists at that hydroelectric plant uh, did. And the Nazis, the Germans got in there, they conquered Norway, and then they took over that plant. And there's, mo- there's been movies made uh, over in Norway and here in the United States about the commando raids that the U.S. and the British and the Norwegian underground mounted to destroy that facility, you know, without trying to, you know, trying not to kill uh, any innocent Norwegians and uh, knock out that heavy water plant because the Germans wanted it so that they, just like in Iran, they want to have these heavy water reactors so they can refine uranium and make a bomb. And that's what the Germans figured that they wanted and because they wanted to have a, a nuclear weapon as well. And thank God they didn't because if they had, if they'd gotten to the nuclear weapon before the United States, we'd all be speaking German now. Oh my God, I don't even want to think. You know, speaking German is okay. I know German. But everything else that came with it, oh my goodness. Don't even want to think about that. Anyways, they didn't get it. Uh, and, the, and there's been movies made about the, that special raid on Norse Hydro. Now, here's another isotope called tritium. All right, so I'm parking the other two up here. Tritium is a hydrogen, one proton, and two neutrons. And this one, the two neutrons and the hydrogen, they're bound in the nucleus this is what we call triple heavy hydrogen, or tritium, TRI for three, uh, three items in the nucleus. And this one is uh, very, very rare. We can manufacture it at a nuclear plant with all those extra neutrons floating around, all right? It's difficult to do. You take a deuterium and you try to capture so another neutron, and you got a tritium, and then you filter the tritiums out. Now, tritium is triple heavy hydrogen, and it is an isotope. Chemically, it will form water, just like everything else, but it will be triple heavy water, all right? Um, and I don't know what the natural occurrence, I think it's pretty, pretty small. Deuterium is fairly common. You know, the percentage is up there. Tritium is is tougher. Now, another thing about tritium, you definitely, civilians are definitely not allowed to uh, possess tritium. It is a radioactive substance. They sometimes use small, tiny amounts of tritium in paint to um, make sure that certain uh, instruments glow in the dark and are visible in uh, darkness, uh, like gun sights, stuff like that. Uh, and, but the real, is, which is, you know, that's nice. There's other things that do that glow in the dark. But here's the other thing about tritium. It is a critical component in a hydrogen bomb. Deuterium as well, hydrogen as well. You can use all three of these in a hydrogen bomb. But tritium is the one that's eas- most easily used. It's hard to refine, uh, but it makes uh, a hydrogen uh, device uh, a lot easier to make. Okay, so civilians like us uh, are not ever going to be able to get our hands on tritium. And if you, if somebody comes up to you on the street and offers to sell you, well, here's a gram of tritium. Uh, give me twenty bucks. Uh, you can tell them out of here. Uh, or I'll, I'll call the FBI in your butt, you know, because, you know, 20 grams, a gram of tritium, you're talking many thousands, maybe even millions of dollars. So if he really had it, he, there's nobody that should ever come up to you and say that. And if they did, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good bet that it's a scam of some kind because civilians will not be allowed to have something like that. All right, now I want to give you a side note on how we separate isotopes. Basically, the isotopes, as I've mentioned, are light, heavier, and then heaviest. 
So you can separate them dynamically with something called a centrifuge, and that's another controversial term over in Iran. They want to get us these high-tech centrifuges or build high-tech centrifuges to refine uranium, okay? And that's what the United States, actually, uh, the United States did not do that in World War II. What the United States did was use a gaseous diffusion at Oak Ridge and then out in uh, Washington State at a place called Hanford up by the Columbia Plateau and electromagnetic separation. This diagram is a, a, a basically a diagram from the Manhattan Project uh, up at Oak Ridge, a place called Y-12, where they operated these calutrons. Uh, and basically what it is, you form a uranium ion. The ones that are heavy with uranium-238, um, they, they shoot them into a magnetic field, and the... Um, the ones that are uranium-238 ions, they take the long way around because they're heavier. But the light ones, uranium-235, that's what they were trying to refine, and they were very successful at it. They cut a little tighter of a corner, and they land in a different spot. So you collect them at that different spot, and if you do it for a year or so, you'll have enough for a weapon. And that's what they did up at Oak Ridge. Gaseous diffusion is another dynamical way because things will diffuse differently if they're heavy versus if they're light. And so we were able to separate the Manhattan Project, uh, basically separate things because they're different masses. Now, if you've ever seen, like uh, in a biology lab, they use centrifuges and to separate, you know, like plasma, blood, you know, blood into the plasma, and then the red blood cells and stuff like that. And then they siphon off the red blood cells. And they siphon off the plasma. Um, in, in a biology lab, you know, they use a centrifuge for doing that. And that's because the, the plasma weighs differently than the, you know, all that iron in the red blood cells. Okay? And so that separates dynamically by mass. Um, now, the United States didn't use that very much in World War II. Uh, they could have, but they decided to do this. Now, here's a picture of a building up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, out by the Tennessee River. Um, all that cold water that they needed to keep things cool. Uh, this is called Y-12. This is during its construction phase. Now, 60 years ago, 1957, uh, you, none of us would be able to even look at this photo. You know, plenty of people will have seen it, but it was top secret. That Most of these buildings are now, I think this one's actually destroyed now. But that's one of the buildings, big, huge building, where they had a bunch of calutrons going up in Oak Ridge. Uh, here's another picture of the calutron principle. Uh, there's a little website, osti.gov. And you can look at the Manhattan, um, uh, Manhattan Project. And you can see here, this is a little bit nicer a picture. The U-235 ions, those are the ones they use for the, for the uh, weapons-grade uranium. They, they follow a tighter curve. They're in a magnetic field. And here's the source. You know. So they zoom out through this slit. And then once they get out here into the magnetic field, the U-235 uh, is collected here. It turns the corner a little bit faster. And 238 is a little heavier, and it slides a little bit further up to the top. Uh, and they collect that, too. You know what they used 238 for? In World War II, they didn't use it for anything. But you know what we use it for now? We use it for making um, extra heavy, dense bullets, you know, one or two of which um, will destroy a Russian tank. And those are called depleted uranium slugs. All right? And this maniac out in... Uh, Las Vegas that killed all those people. He was just using regular lead bullets. But if he had had, I don't even want to think about it. Well, he couldn't have gotten it. He, I mean, you can't get uh, depleted uranium slugs down at the hardware store or anything. But that's what we use it for now. Now, let's get back to this idea of what is an isotope. All elements have isotopes. Now, here are the three stable ones for oxygen. 
Oxygen 16, we know. Eight and eight. Eight protons, eight neutrons. Another stable variety of oxygen is oxygen 17. Oxygen 18, that's 10 and eight. Oxygen 17 is nine and eight. Nine neutrons, eight protons. There are some um, elements, there are some isotopes that de- they're not stable, they decay radioactively. All right? So for instance, radium has a very rapid decay. That's why radium is another one of these substances that will glow in the dark. Part of the radioactive decay process means it emits a little bit of light at part of the decay uh, through the steps um, to get to the daughter nuclei. Um, medium length or medium strength radioactivity. Uh, yeah, carbon. There's, there's isotopes of carbon that will decay. They're formed in the atmosphere. We breathe them in. We breathe them out. Plants breathe them in and form them into carbohydrates. And then animals eat them. And then we eat the animals. So various elements of carbon build up in living things for that reason. And as soon as they die, they, they stop acquiring that particular radioactive element. And so the number of that radioactive carbon in your body or in a plant, you know, once the plant's cut down or burned or something like that, it doesn't acquire any more of the, the radioactive carbons. It just has the regulars. And so what we do is we count them up. And from that, we figure out how old, it, how, old how long ago it, the tree was cut down or how long ago the campfire was. If we find some guy's bones, you know, like a skull or something like that, we can use that to, to figure out how long ago that person died. You know, whether it's uh, back in the Revolutionary War, we can use carbon dating for that. If it's back during, in 900 AD, when the times of the Vikings, yeah, we can use carbon dating for that. Uh, 4,000 years ago, uh, the time of King David, the time of the ancient Greeks, you know, Homer and all those chaps. Yeah, we can use carbon dating for that. Uh, even further back, the Babylonians in Sumeria, the ancient Babylon. Yeah, we can use carbon dating for that. Even back to the Ice Age, you know, on the order of 10,000 years, we can use carbon dating for that uh, at various uh, strength levels. And, we, and basically what we do is we count the number of isotopes and we form a ratio. You know, how many are there, you know, per thousand? How many are there per million? How many are there per billion? And then from that, we can figure out the, the rough age of when the tree died or when the cattle was cooked. Maybe you find a cattle bone. You know, that's the same, same basic thing. So age and location can be deduced. All right, and... Uh, so basically you're checking ratios or, you know, like parts per million, things like that. All right. Now I'm going to go through some stuff here with you, um, uh, for oxygen and because oxygen is pretty important. Oxygen isotopes are pretty important for us in astronomy and in a lot of areas. Uh, but before we do that, I'm just going to invite you to take a look at this picture here. And you might be thinking, Dr. B, why of all days when Florida is covered with rain and clouds, do you have a lovely beach on a sunny day that looks really, really nice in class? And what's, what's up with that, Dr. B? Well, I have a one-word answer. Smoke. S-M-O-W. Go ahead and jot down that word. SMO. S-M-O-W. And now you're even more... Dr. B, you've lost it. S-M-O-W. Didn't even spell it right. No, I spelled it right. S-M-O-W stands for Standard Mean Ocean Water. And so what scientists have done. They've dropped, um, you know, collection buckets 
down the bottom of the ocean, you know, the middle of the ocean, all over the planet, and then they count up the oxygen isotopes. And here's the ratio. The ratio for most water on the planet in the ocean uh, is about 2,005.20 parts per million. Right? And that is about 0.20520%. Right? So it's less than a percent. But that's, you know, that's significant. So when we analyze water in, in the oceans of Earth, that's about the proportion for oxygen 18. Most oxygen is good old 8 plus 8, oxygen 16. Right? But a measurable fraction, you know, we put it through a calutron or some kind of a separation device, and we figure out this is about the, the ratio. Now, oxygen 17 is a little different. Right? It's not quite as common about 380 parts per million, right? That's 0.03799%, all right? So now that's for the ocean water. And what scientists have done is use that, you know, they, they gather water over the years, samples from as many places as they can. This seems to be the average. And, and then now when they find some water in a, a, a meteorite, you know, a chunk of an asteroid that falls to Earth and somebody picks it up and takes it to the lab, and it's got a little bit of water in there uh, or a little bit of oxygen, silicate, you know, SiO2, silicon dioxide. Yeah, those oxygens too. It's not just water. Uh, what we do is we, we look at that and we think, Whoa, let's compare that to uh, the oceans of Earth. And what we find is that some meteorites, asteroids, comets, the oxygen is roughly about comparable to what we find on Earth. But a lot of them, no way. And this chart here um, is a chart that shows you... Um, on two different axes, uh, the vertical axes, that's the oxygen 17 isotope ratio. And this is, this is actually how far the comet or the asteroid or whatever rock, moon rock you're looking at, how far it deviates from SMOW, right? So this is called the delta, uh, that's delta 17. How, so if, if you have a positive number in the top half of this graph here, that means, you know, your delta 17 ratio is positive. That means you got a little bit more oxygen 17 in that rock than standard mean ocean water. If you're negative, you know, like down here it says minus 50 on the left-hand side, that means you're depleted of that kind of oxygen. Oxy so water of Earth, oxygen 17, it's about 380. If we've got minus 50 here, that's a way, uh, and it's actually logarithmic. We're not supposed to do logarithms in this class, but it's a logarithmic scale. And minus 50 means you've got less than 380 parts per million. All right. And that's important. We find that certain, and, and excuse me, um, similar over here, the horizontal scale is the delta 18 ratio, okay? So out here to the right where it says 20, that means you've got a little bit more oxygen 18 than you find in the ocean of Earth. And if it's negative, like minus 50 on the far left here, that means it's a little bit less than 2,005 parts per million, all right? Now that's significant for us because we find that when we um, look at asteroids, this is asteroids, or meteorites, I should say. Certain kind of meteorites called chondrules, um, they have uh, isotope ratios that fit on this line. And then there's certain inclusions, these are called CAIs, it's a, it's a little subfraction of meteorites. When they analyze that, it's even further down this line. And so what a planetary scientist is going to ask himself, well, how come it's different from the, the oxygen in the waters of Earth? 
And then, the, you know, and that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. You know, why do asteroids have a different mixture of isotopes than water? Have you guys heard the theory? They, they've developed it here at, at UCF or made a lot of progress in it, that water on the surface of Earth came from comets. The ice, the water ice from comets zillions of years ago and over the eons of time that crashed into Earth, melted, or got vaporized, more like it, and eventually fell as liquid water. And they think, a lot of people think that that's where the water uh, on the surface of Earth came from, comets. Yeah, so, so that's the idea. Yeah, so if, so if you look at comets now, as you suggest, does that have the same ratio as SMOW? So we want to know that. And if it does, then that says, whoa, maybe it's really true that the oceans of Earth came to Earth as comets. So... It's a whole, it's, you know, it's a really big topic of study. And isotopes help us get a hold of that. All right, so we do the same thing with moon rocks, anything that we can. And sometimes we can even see it when we look at spectra of a comet. Uh, we can even, you know, like the tail of a comet, we look at the light, put it through diffraction grading. We can sometimes see the sign of different isotopes of oxygen, uh, carbon, and, and so on. Uh, and that tells us a lot. The big one for us is the oxygen ratios. All right. And so uh, looking at these two delta ratios um, tells us a lot. All right. Now, I'll be showing you how to calculate delta 17 and delta 18 next week. I'll show you with a real live uh, asteroid uh, data, uh, and actually I think I'll use one of these CAIs uh, for the real data that we work on next week. And it's basically just doing proportions and stuff. It's pretty easy. Um, one more thing before we uh, dismiss. A few years ago, NASA sent a spacecraft called Stardust up into space with the plan, the intention of flying through the tail of a comet and opening up its doors and scooping up the dust that flies out in the tail of a comet. for just that reason, you know, to analyze that dust. And so they, they sent out this spacecraft, the Stardust spacecraft, and we'll look at real data of that next week. And they collected some of that comet dust. And guess what they found? A lot of cool stuff. They analyzed the, the isotopes quite a bit, us, the Japanese. Guess what else they found? They found a single grain of dust that could only have come from another star. The sun could not have made it. Real stardust, we got some. A little teeny sign of it. And you know how they figured it out? Isotopes. All right, we'll talk more about that on Tuesday. Look for your uh, reading assignment over the weekend, and I'll see you then.